It's six minutes after 10 a.m. here in Accra. Wherever you are watching us from across the globe, you are warmly welcome to the meeting edition of the Africa Business Conversations. This event is brought to you by Time Ketsi of ABN David Africa and is streaming live on our YouTube and Facebook handles. The Africa Business Conversation is a forum that puts the spotlight on how businesses in Africa may go beyond the stereotypes and think differently about the numerous opportunities in Africa's fast-changing business ecosystem. A very insightful and interactive session awaits because we have a very, very special guest. This event will be moderated by award-winning journalist Kojo Akoto Bwating from Accra and Solomon Sewanja from Uganda. Gentlemen, over to you. Much welcome Much. to the uh, AB and David event. This is the conversation we've all been waiting for, the Africa Business Conversation. My name is Kojo Akoto Bwating. I am in Accra. And my co-moderator is Solomon Sevanja, who is a Ugandan investigative journalist and the executive director of the African Institute for Investigative Journalism. He's also the winner of the BBC World News Komla Dumont Award 2019. Today's conversation has a special um, guest and a focal person. She's been someone who has led a lot of change in the various industries she's found herself in. Uh, until recently, most Ghanaians knew her as the first Ghanaian woman to head a multinational telecommunications company. But she's done a lot. Um, she's known as the former CEO of Airtel Ghana. She led change at Airtel, a co-founder of the Executive Women Network. But she has a background in automobile. She's done, uh, she's, she's been with Ford Motor Company. She's worked at Tigo, which is Millicom Ghana Limited, Vodafone, Airtel, uh, she's been in manufacturing, the automotive space, telecommunications, financial services in Europe and in Africa. Um, she's currently a managing director at Morgan Stanley and the author of the book, The Bold New Normal, one of the top 10 books in my personal collection. Uh, we, are, we are very happy to have Lucy Quist being a resource person for today. But before I even introduce her, let me also tell you about some of the things that she does. Messy Ships comes to Ghana on the regular, and she currently serves on the board of Messi Ships, on the board of INSEAD as well. She's an advisory board member of Yamachi Biotech, one of the businesses I believe is going to make healthcare available, affordable, and better for Ghanaians and Africans. She has a first class degree from the University of East London in Chartered uh, Electrical and Electronic Engineer. She had a first class. She was an MBA from, from INSEAD in France, and she's a woman of many parts in Ghanaian um, 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 folklore and Ghanaian wisdom. We say when you educate a man, you educate an individual. When you educate a woman, you educate a nation. But Lucy Quist, in this particular sense, is not just a nation, but the whole continent, because she's impacting uh, on African women leaders and causing change, even in the male category. We are very happy to have the latest queen on the block, the Vlisco brand ambassador for the year 2022. And to talk about Vlisco, let me give you a bit of history. When the Ashanti kingdom wanted to have diplomatic relations with the Dutch kingdom then in 1835, the king sent his son and his nephew to go and live in the Netherlands. His, his son became the first African engineer in the Netherlands. His name is Kwesi Boache. And Vlisco was birthed in the Netherlands around the same time. So there's a lot of connection culturally, economically, and in fashion when it comes to the Dutch and Ghanaians. And Vlisco is holding the, uh, Vlisco is pushing that particular frontier. And Lucy Quist is the torch bearer for the year 2022, leading the change that we all wish to see. Welcome to all of you, and welcome to you, our queen, Lucy Quist. How do you feel being the Vlisco brand ambassador for 2020? So, so now when we call you, we, we, we should refer to you as Her Majesty. So Her Majesty Lucy Quist, how do you feel being the brand ambassador for Vlisco? 
It's, it, first of all, um, could you thank you for the very, very kind introduction. I'm looking forward to our conversation today with you and and thank you to everyone who has taken the time to join us today. I believe that these conversations are important. So I really appreciate AB and David for putting this together because we need to talk, strategize, and take action. So first question, how does it feel? It is an absolutely awesome honor to um, recognized as um, you know, a Blisco ambassador ambassador um, this time. It's a true, MISCO is a true representation of ingenuity, our pride, our confidence, entrepreneurship as Ghanaian women impacting our families, our communities, our societies, and being inspirational. And for me, to be honest, it's a full circle experience because many people don't know about me to my two Blisco facts growing up it was called Holland as you 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 um um rightly pointed out the history um and when I was a child there was actually a Holland um retailer as part of her day job she would also um act as agent for Holland she would take Holland she was in the UK at the time and take the samples and um when she was work she would sell them um, and obviously she got a mission, which was Blisco. So such a full circle experience for me because I remember being a child and holding the end of the cloth for my mother as she got into to distribute. So that's my little Blisco story. And I look forward to this opportunity about empowering Ghanaian entrepreneurs. So we're going to spend time with entrepreneurs through this. Um, and Ghanaian women in general, especially the women who work for Blisco. So a true honor and opportunity to continue to influence change. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. So today's conversation is about positioning to attract funding for businesses in the bold new Africa. And after it's happening, now the Secretariat launched their website about three weeks ago. The Secretariat, which is in Ghana, says that trading for AFTA is beginning very soon. A lot has been said about AFTA and the opportunities for the growth of the African continent. But COVID also hit whilst we're preparing after to position Africa as, as the powerhouse of the global economy. And everything slowed down. Now, Ghana, where I am, is going to the IMF for help. Other African economies are also struggling and governments are looking to get help. This is not affecting only governments. Businesses are also being impacted. Startups are already looking for funding and in my experience i've interviewed about 400 500 startups in the past 10 years and whenever i ask how do you get funding most of them would take me outside the shores of ghana and outside the borders of africa they are all trying to get funding from outside the continent and access to finance still remains one of the biggest challenges within the con continent we've seen venture capital firms springing up we've seen governments putting incentives in place for banking institutions to make finance available. We've also seen the growth of FinTech. Some people believe that FinTech may be the bridge needed to ensure financial inclusion, but many questions still remain unanswered. And that conversation is happening today. And we know that Lucy can help us with some answers and point us in the right places. So I'm gonna hand over to my co-moderator, Solomon Savanja. Solomon, start us off with a finance conversation and how we get access to finance and run African businesses and our economies to create the value we are looking for. Thank you, Kojo. So first of all, I think that Africa celebrates you, Lucy. I know that Kojo was taking you too much towards West Africa, but I think the entire continent celebrates your success and really proud to have you on the show today. A very good afternoon from East Africa. I know it's morning in West Africa and really it's great to have everyone who's watching from all across the continent. Um, Lucy, let's start off with businesses in Africa. I've just been reading a report here about businesses in sub-Saharan Africa. We have about 44 million businesses, and most of those are SMEs, uh, which, and, you know, which are employing over 51% of people across the continent. Now, many of these SMEs literally require money. I mean, I run a business myself, and post-COVID, it was difficult to keep, you know, staff alive. I had to look for money 
and this is why this conversation is very dear to me, Lucy. And so a lot of it, you know, we run to the, um, for example, the Uganda Development Bank here in Uganda. We're looking at money lenders, the sharks with high interest rates. Everyone was looking for capital to resuscitate their businesses post COVID. So, so we, we then, you know, at one point hit a dead end, you know, cut staff, business stagnated, no growth. So let me start with this question, Lucy. Is there capital available for businesses, especially SMEs perhaps? Is the capital available? Or is, if it's available, is it easily accessible? So there's one thing being available, but also other things being accessible. Lucy, let's start there. You know, that is, uh, I, I, I agree with you, um, both you and Kojo, in my experience, I spent a lot of time with um, SMEs because really they are the backbone of our prosperity. As you said, they employ more than half of our population. And I've been very fortunate to work in countries, including East African countries. So you're absolutely right, this is an African conversation. Available, but not available at seas. So the challenge, one of the challenges we have on the continent is that we're equal competitors for access to global today. Capital goes where it believes you get the best. So that's the start large globe we are part of the globe and whether it's african money or foreign money it's all return so that's part of the challenge the aspect to be more been done and fragmented is that the channels through which the available can be distributed are limited in a very get access it's only a huge amount trying to get the ways in which and do you hear me solomon because i well lucy you're quite breaking um you, you, you've really been breaking. I think you have some challenges with your network. Um, yeah, you've been quite breaking. Cool. Can you hear me? Um, Lucy, Lucy, can you come closer to your Wi Fi, perhaps? Um, you've been quite breaking. Kojo, could you hear Lucy? I hope um, Lucy, your, your network is a bit bad. Um, quality is about five over 10. So if you can correct that. But whilst you do okay. that, uh, all for right. all those um, listening to this conversation, you can us join the ABC um, with your questions, your comments. As we go along, we'll be reading your questions to Lucy uh, for her to attend to your questions and your comments as well. Lucy. It's still, it's still not, it's still not okay. It's still not okay. So, if you can take about two minutes to fix that, um, we would really appreciate that. Yeah. So, Kojo, um, as Lucy tries to fix that, I was just um, reading this small report here that was talking about, you know, that in sub-Saharan Africa alone, about 44 million micro and small and medium enterprises, almost all of them, which are macro, um, provide about 51% of vital jobs to, you know, different African uh, people. But... The, the problem that, you know, access to money, to capital, to help their businesses get resuscitated, especially post-COVID. And this paper perhaps was looking at uh, concessional debt and equity as an, an, as, as an option to support businesses across the continent to really, you know, um, come back. I will give you a classic example in Uganda. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we got the IMF the international monetary fund gave us money the world bank gave us money we saw that many of the big uh, lenders were giving african 
and indeed low development countries money to help their businesses uh, remain afloat. First um, was that some of this money was a bit expensive, you know, with high interest rates, right? Whilst others came with a lot of conditions. For example, um, oh, Lucy, it's good to have you back. Um, you look better. Now we can hear you. Can you hear me better now? It's, it's yes, awesome. Now it's we better can, now. We can hear you. Yeah, perfect. So maybe Excellent. you can take it away. So, We're just trying to dig it up. My apologies. Should we take that question again? Solomon, would you like to ask yes. the question? So the question, apologize to everyone. The question yeah, Solomon yeah, asked is that capital is not available and or, or is it that capital is available but difficult to access in Africa? Yeah. Yeah, my starting point there, just to recap, was that, so first of all, capital is available globally, but the challenge is that all capital in the world is competing globally, right? Whether it's an African investor, a foreign investor, everyone is looking for a great return. Nobody invests um, from a, a, as a charitable act. So then we have to understand that as SMEs or as Africans, we need to make sure that we're making our investment as attractive as others. Right. So hopefully we'll delve into more of that conversation as we go on. So what first is, yes, there's availability, but it's competitive. The second point I'd make is that distribution of access of capital can be a challenge, especially in a very fragmented SME market. Right. What are the channels through which you are able to assess and the cost of actually investing in these SMEs? And that obviously my, my response here is focused very much on the supply side. Um, but hopefully as we delve in more, we can talk about um, the, the demand side of the SME, because what we really want to do is make sure that in spite of whatever challenges exist, our SMEs are able to position themselves appropriately to attract whatever in funding that is available to their businesses, right? We want to be able to take action. And that's where the boldness comes into it, that whatever situation we're in, we need to boldly actually act to attract the money that we need to grow our businesses. So Lucy, how can, and you talked about capital being very competitive and it goes where it should really be multiplied and you know grow. How can African businesses position themselves to take advantage of that opportunity? Yeah. So one of the things we have to be mindful of is that it costs money to distribute money and manage money, right? Put it very simplistically. And in some situations, we have SMEs that could benefit from being on a larger scale than they're on, right? So we'll walk through a number of things. So one is, the first thing is, what is the actual size of the SME? Is the SME um, of, a, of a size that's critical enough? So there's a wide range of what we call SMEs. Or is there an opportunity to actually partner to be a bigger SME? Do we all have to run our businesses individually and separately, right? So for instance, um, I have a friend who, who is a fund manager and one of her biggest challenges in running funds across the continent is that many of the investors that she's able to raise money from are not, do, do not want to invest in very small entities. In fact, for many of them, ticket sizes below $250,000 is too small a ticket. Because if, if you think about it, if I invest 50,000 in three businesses, I will have to have five times the oversight as what I would do in investing 250 in one business. But you can only put 250,000 as an illustrative example in a business that has the capacity to not only absorb, but generate a return on that money, right? So when we talk about large financial institutions, that's part of the challenge with the actual size of what people are actually trying to, to, to get for their investment. Now, further down the line, then you start to find that people are faced with um, funding that's particularly um, local market driven. It tends to be, it would be a smaller ticket size, but then that becomes tied to an even, in, in some cases, um, attracting higher expectations of return or, or interest. So there's an element of SMEs actually even looking at the structure and the form of their business. And I'm using a term that we don't use enough, but sometimes there's benefit to partnering 
with someone else and forming a larger entity, it could be one other business, two other businesses, you become a shareholder in a larger entity than a sole owner in, 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 a small, in a small entity. So that's one. How do you actually make sure you have a critical market size? The other thing that SMEs can do to position is to be able to better articulate the story of the value chain that they are actually serving. So what are you overall, what is the service you're overall providing? What is the value chain and what's the market opportunity end to end? And then the last thing I would touch on here, and we will talk more overall, is the fact that several business, several um, investors, especially investors that are international, are always thinking about how do I get my money out? What is the exit strategy? Do I, how can I possibly sell my share um, listed or how do I get a return? So as an SME, when you're thinking about your in, uh, attracting invest, investment, try to put on the hat that says, I'm thinking about what the investor is thinking. Don't think about the investor as just a good person. Everyone is a good person, but good people want to, to get a return. So put yourselves in their shoes and ask, how is that person, since this money is not a gift, how is this person going to get their money's worth? And how am I going to articulate that story to them that doesn't only demonstrate my, that my business will grow and do well, but they will make their money out of it. Wow, well, the size is enough. Oh, yeah. being a okay, now we can hear you. Smaller ticket sizes are a problem because spreading to fifty thousand dollars across five businesses means um, five times more the oversight, which is more cost for investors. So you are suggesting that we should partner for growth. Now, in this regard, how do businesses structure themselves to be ready for partnerships? Um, I'm asking this question because. If you look at even Ghana's Registrar General's Department's um, data, majority of the businesses are enterprises, one-man businesses, not well-structured businesses with proper corporate governance. How do businesses structure themselves so that these partnerships come easy to help them um, grow together? Thank you so much for that question because I feel that question is at the heart, at the heart of um, our... Uh, now, now we're talking demand side, what we as SMEs demanding the money, the demand side can do to help. So, and I, I oh, you'll find that I love real life um, examples. Um, there was, um, and I, I shall not name them because I haven't asked for permission, um, but one of the sort of development partners that work uh, across the continent in the you know, sovereign development fund, um, I, I, I spent some time, um, a, a, a couple, a year or so, working with them or in terms of how to distribute their funds. And as you can imagine, we have very stringent um, processes um, to ensure that the business could actually demonstrate through clear documentation um, and bookkeeping uh, the viability of the, fu the, the future um, businesses. Now, across Africa, women actually run more SMEs than even men. And that fact is important because what we found in this fund was that not only were female-run businesses, unfortunately, less likely to um, 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 be eligible because of, of the governance that you mentioned, but even when we set ourselves a target of trying to ensure that at least a third of the funds are dispersed to women-led women SMEs, the problem still persisted. And it persists exactly to the question you're asking, process, structure, governance. Even when you're running a sole entrepreneurship, you need to have very clear processes documented. Now, I'm not suggesting that a small SME should go and um, invest immediately in an SAP, some big software that will do everything for them and it's an, it's an overhead. Sometimes process documentation can be as basic as you have a, a file that says, this is our process of how we reconcile um, a, a invoice. This is our process for making payments. This is our process for deciding what we're going to spend on marketing. This is our process for this. It can be as simple as that clearly documented. And that will immediately tie into your bookkeeping because your bookkeeping will then be tied to this line or, or in my books corresponds to this process. This line corresponds to that process. 
And then you can have some governance oversight. And again, it doesn't have to be a, a massive board. It could be that you have a couple of people who keep you honest. They're your advisory team. You meet them maybe sometimes even just twice a year. But that starting point of having processes, structure, appropriate, transparent bookkeeping, and some degree of independent oversight is very important for an SME. Because what then happens is that as the businesses grow, your business grows, your processes will mature with them. The process that used to be uh, uh, run by one person and it will suddenly become a process by, whereby one person runs it, but there's somebody else who checks it. And then it's one person runs it, one person checks it, and suddenly it goes to two people, three people, and then there's oversight. So you have to be able to articulate clear process structures, clear bookkeeping, and clear oversight. Even I wouldn't even use the big word governance if you're a small entity, but that's what you're doing. Because if you don't do that, you're unable to give an investor the confidence that they can follow through how their money is being used by the business over time. And it's again, it's important that they're able to have that oversight transparently and confidently. Um, so it's an important question. I've had many people say it's such an oversight, it's such a bother, but let's take it away from an SME and think about your life as an individual uh, or your life as, a, as, as a, someone leading a family. If you don't have clear structures and processes in place, timing when you get various things done, you will struggle as a family to maximize the potential of what your family can achieve. And, it's, and even that, you're not answerable to, to somebody. So you're answerable to yourself. So think about a situation where you're running a business, somebody is giving you their money, they're independent of you, they have to trust you, but they need clear processes and structures to be able to have that confidence that their money is being put to good use. So, so Lucy, you, you really make it clearer. And while she's speaking about this, I think it, you know, it applies um, you in real life, you know, real life. Um, so I, I, I run both a business, but I also run an institute, which is a non-profit. And, you know, you, you're also speaking to me, so both ways, talking about the processes, talking about setting up systems and structures, and also independent oversight. There is this issue that many people who operate, you know, businesses, and the issue of oversight and someone to really call you out, you know, there's this fear that if you have all these systems, they can clog you to grow your, your business. You know what I mean? Like you want to make some significant decisions to grow the business, but yet the processes clog it. And you have because you know you want to then over overtake the processes even when you've established them to make the call to grow the business. I think very many businesses find themselves in that position of you want to make a decision to maybe take the business forward, but because you've set up systems and processes, they sort of stop you up, and you have to learn a discipline of subjecting yourself to the process. How do you go past that? Yeah. So. We get past it by shifting our mindset around the impact and the purpose of these processes. Because you're right, I mean, even in running businesses, well-established businesses, I've had colleagues come to me and say, well, Lucy, these processes are so stifling. I mean, I don't know why I have to do this, this, this. I know exactly what we agreed strategically. Let me just go ahead and, and do it. The challenge is that Maybe sometimes it works, maybe a lot of the time it works. But if you don't have a process in place, it means that you're not fully analyzing, assessing and reviewing the full scope of the opportunity. You're not fully looking at the, pit, the pitfalls. You're not looking at the unintended outcomes. Um, and you're not actually maximizing the input of the inter intellect of people around you who could help even um, develop the idea even further. So different businesses at different stages of maturity have different uh, extents of process, right? But what the, the one thing I want people to take out of this, when it comes to process and governance, you cannot have zero, even if you're, on, you're, you're running this business on your own. The starting point is that you have to have something, even if it's as simple as writing things down. Where you're an institution, you're a larger SME, and you, you want to expand your business, having the governance and process in place 
will actually ensure that what you inter you spend the money on. So let me go, I, I think you know examples bring it home better. Say you're you're a business um, based in Kenya, and you're doing well. Um, maybe you're not you're not yet national, but you're doing well in sort of the region that you serve. And you feel that the immediate next opportunity is not actually uh, in Kenya. You feel that the next opportunity is, is in, in neighboring Tanzania. And you probably have your reasons why you think that Tan the, you know, a, a region in Tanzania is your, your next big, big stop. If you have proper governance in place, I'd expect that that governance body will challenge you to actually demonstrate very clearly why, first of all, you wouldn't um, uh, focus on your existing market, which is um, um, probably a lower opportunity cost because you're already there. Challenge you to think very clearly about the opportunity and maybe some of the challenges you could potentially face entering a different country with different regulations, different market structure, um, different co competitive landscape, which you're not aware of yet, but you will learn. And so once you've documented all of this, what happens is that you're more likely to interrogate what else you should be doing. You may still go to Uganda. The conclusion may still be that you will still go. But um, I said Tanzania and I changed it to Uganda. Um, they bring Tanzania. But the truth of the matter is that you would have do documented and, ha and provided yourself and your team with some foresight around what to expect and what to do. You know, I, I, I recently um, had a, a, a question from um, a, young, a young lady, SME, um, she started a, a travel business and she had key concern with similarly funding. And I asked her a very simple question. You know, what's your market size? What is the size of the addressable market? Who are your potential customers? And she had done none of this research. She had none of that information, but she wanted funding to grow your biz her business. Grow the business to where? That's, 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 that's interesting. So you need to get these things, all these things checked out before you get in. So now let's, let's talk about the to-dos in attracting funding. And later I would like you to also- Are we losing Lucy? Um, later I would like you to share your thoughts on how to approach debt, equity, and grants. And I'll share a story about that later. So okay. what are some of the things, the checkboxes that SMEs and businesses need to tick to make them investment ready? What are some of the boxes? Okay, huh. so here's an interesting one, especially for an SME, but this actually applies to mature businesses that have been around a hundred years or so, but especially for SMEs, the first thing you have to realize is that the investor is investing in the leadership team. That is actually point number one. They're investing in their confidence in your know-how, your foresight, your ability to execute, your ability to lead, your ability to take risk, but take it in a calculated way, your ability to spot opportunity. It's all about the actual people running the business. So, so for me, that's the first thing people need to, to remember when an investor comes and looking at who are you? Um, and again, I go back to a story. I recently had another um, potential SME come to me um, three people, two of them came to the meeting um, and their point was about attracting investment. And I had to tell them very nicely, but truthfully, that in their management team, they had someone who was young, probably in his 40s. I didn't ask his exact age, but he came across as such. But the two people who were speak speaking to me were actually nearing retirement. And I had to, I said to them, to attract investment, you need to reposition who is leading this young entity. Because if your entity is so young and you tell an investor that is being run by a retiree, the investor is thinking, how long will this retiree run this business before they feel they have no more energy for it? Yeah. And it makes sense because sometimes it could take you 10 years before you make any money, enough to take your money out. So I give them that piece of advice that, first of all, you need to do a reshuffle. Let this guy be the face of your, your company. Let him lead the company. You can support him in, in advising. So that's one example. But a lot of the time, it's not just about age. They're looking at the skill, the competence, the background, all the things that I've listed uh, um, previously. So that's number one. 
Number two is that the, to position yourself, you need, this is a, a it's going to sound um, almost, um, it's something we take for granted. You need to be able to tell your story. You need to be able to tell your story. Tell it in a way that makes the message very clear of what exactly you're selling to the investor because you are selling to the investor to buy into your company to invest. So the people, the story, the journey, then articulate very clearly in that story, the opportunity. What is the opportunity? Then you start to talk about the governance and the structures and the processes that we, we, we talk about. So there's a very clear flow in terms of what you need to know to make sure that you're positioning for that company. But don't, and I know, uh, Kodri, you said we're going to come on to this. Don't ever view any investor as somebody doing this charitably. If you have that mindset, it starts to impact how you actually position yourself for, to attract that funding. Forgetting that that person is looking not just across Ghana, Kenya, Cote d'Ivoire, DRC as opportunities. They're equally thinking Estonia, Croatia, USA, UK are in that same conversation. And there are different means to access these markets today. So um, those are some of the things I would say be extremely mindful of because we don't talk a lot enough about the actual people running the SME and the confidence that the people need to give the investor. So your people packaging must be right to give the investors confidence. You need to be able to tell your story to give not just the investor the confidence, but the market the confidence in your business. And you also don't have to view an investor as somebody doing this charitably. That leads us to the next question, which is grant equity debt. Is there a formula to use in, in, in the decision to either go for debt, equity, or grant? I'm asking this because there are a few startups I know in Ghana that have won grants, and the founders have been complaining to me that it keeps them moving around and in meetings all the time. So now they are spending the time they have to be on the field to get the job done in meetings, traveling around. Um, there are those who also rejected equity offers because they thought that they would lose control of their businesses. And there are people who are also running away from debt because of the interest rates. And um, you may not get a moratorium to give you some breathing space to put things in place and all that. So what's the mix when you are considering financing for your business? considering all the challenges and the advantages of the different forms? Excellent question. Um, so before I delve into grant equity and debt, um, the best form of funding for your business is actually self-funding, especially when you're a small business. Um, and that is, um, it, you know, I'm sure people are looking at me and saying, Lucy, please don't state the obvious. If we had the money, we wouldn't be here. Um, and, and so before I, I delve into that, I'll tell you one of the stories that, um, not story, one of the bit, the case studies that struck me um, when I was in business school, um, we, we, one of the many uh, case studies was about Dell, Dell Computers, right? Um, Michael Dell founded this company. Um, and one of the very clever things he did was to establish a, ne a negative working capital. So when we talk about working capital, as most of their businesses know, it's the amount of you know, running, operating money that you have locked in the business, right? To, 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 to cover various costs, buying your inputs and so on. And normally it's a positive number. And when you run a, a business, as your business grows, sometimes your, your working capital has to grow and so on and so forth. So working capital. But what he did was that he focused on the timing between receipts and um, receipts and disbursements. So the timing between when money comes in versus when money has to go out. And he managed to work out and make sure that the money came in before the money had to go out, i.e. He, he would be paid for product before he had to pay his suppliers, right? So that's negative working capital. Now, am I saying that's feasible for everybody? No, but what I'm demonstrating is a mindset because if you have negative working capital, what essentially you're doing is that you're able to grow your business because obviously there'll be a bit left over as it's negative over and over again. And you, you, you can invest some of that in growth. 
Um, so I'm talking about a mindset around, around your capital and how you're, you're, especially from your operating expenditure, I'm not talking about long uh, investment in fixed um, uh, 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 um, uh, investment in, in assets. I'm just talking about working capital. So I, would, I, would, I wanted to share that from a mindset point of view. So now let's take a step back and talk about the specific question you asked around grant equity uh, and debt. Grants have been an area of concern for me and you highlight very well the, the experience of many SMEs, which is grants keep them busy. Not only do grants keep them busy, um, I have found that the grant amounts are relatively small, but they make a difference to the business. So I'm not knocking the, the value. Um, but also they tend to come with an in, a, a mindset for many grant um, providers, which is ends up making the business shift from doing this to doing this to doing this. And you end up finding an SME going round and round in circles because this grant provider made this call and asked them to do this. And another one said this and another one said that. So the challenge I would say with grants is that grants is that they can be distracting in some of the ways that they're structured. However, I think for a small entity that definitely needs some um, more easily accessible funding, I would encourage you that you do not make grants your full business strategy, but try to um, attract grants at a certain point, but be astute enough to view them as I need, I, I can't make this my long-term funding strategy. It serves a purpose at a given time. Be very strong. I know an SME who through a, a grant offer, they were asked to, um, re-domicile their company from Africa to um, a location in the US. Um, and that, in that case, he turned the money down. And I thought he did absolutely the right thing because he has his vision. Um, but at the same time, if you're, you're using grants in the context of um, really, I need this money for my next phase or to plug my working capital, a very specific purpose, um, go for the grant, but I don't think it's a long-term funding show. Your business has to then continue to grow and now get into the conversation around equity and debt. On equity, that is where I believe we need probably our biggest mindset shift um, because equity can come in different forms. Equity can come in the form of the partnership that I, I, I mentioned, for instance, where you're partnering or you're, you're actually merging with a business that's in the, at the next stage or the previous stage of the value chain that you're serving. And so suddenly you have a bigger business, but your share of the business is, is reduced. And effectively, that other partner has, has become an equity investor. So not necessarily just cash, but actually um, um, the business itself. But in some cases, um, equity can mean money coming in and a dilution of, of your share. Um, equity can be a very powerful means of growth, not just because of the, um, the, the funding it brings, but also because an equity partner is more likely to take operational interest in your business, not just what you report at the end, but that real sort of um, they, they may even want to become part of running the business, but in terms of over, oversight, an equity investor is more likely to focus on your, your running um, day to day. So you get the be benefit of not just the funding, but also that equity partner who is willing to um, help you think about the business and grow and grow the business. Um, how many, but to people listening, I challenge people how many are willing to see a dilution. And again, I'm a big, big lover of stories. So let me tell you another story. And this was actually in fisheries, very successful um, um, fisheries company doing well, but it had a lot of potential. Um, even though it wasn't, it was no longer being run as a sole proprietorship. It was set up properly. There were different um, people involved and it was, it had a separate CFO and, and, and involved. It was a sole ownership. So the equity belonged to one person. He had a brilliant um, CFO. The CFO managed to um, attract funding for this business. 
it would have become a much larger entity. But the founder couldn't deal with the idea that he wouldn't be the sole equity um, investor. And that was the reason why he turned down the investment. Now, because this sector was seen as such a great opportunity, what ended up happening is that he had a team member leave, take on the investor, and now that person who left is now running a bigger business than the business that he left behind. So mindset is a big challenge for us when it comes to equity investment. And I know when we have these calls, we tend to think externally um, about equity investment, but what if the equity investor is actually your neighbor, your friend, a partner who has money, who is willing to put it into your business instead of building another house. Think about it. Are you willing to cede some of that ownership and control of that business to allow someone else to be a, a participant, even if they're not a founder? Um, for me, of the three forms of, 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 of investment, if you could really drive equity that is probably the most, but yes, equity does mean that somebody's owed money as in it's a share of the business. But I think equity can be one of our most po powerful means of transforming our continents and growing our businesses, which I believe we're insufficiently engaging because too many of us are holding on to the idea of ownership and ownership being almost a representation of who you are as an individual. Let's talk a little bit social here. People tie their own identity to this business. They tie their own identity to how it's doing, to be able to claim that it's all there and to be able to show whether it's you know, assets that they buy, that this is what my business did for me. Think beyond that. If you think about your business independently and you think about this business as not just being for you, but the fact that it serves a community, a nation, a region, a continent, would you be willing to get money into it and partners into it to make sure we make a much bigger impact on the continent or are you going to tie it to just you? Grants won't do that. Grants are not designed to make the business you know, grow, grow and grow and grow beyond. Equity has the potential to do that and equity can be more, is, is a more patient form of investment if you believe in the money, in, sorry, in the idea of the company. And then let me talk, touch on the, the last piece, which is debt. Pure debt on the African continent is a real challenge for us, right? Um, and the challenge isn't just the ability to attract it. And, and in many cases, it, it, is, it is possible to attract if you have good governance and processes and you can really demonstrate to that lending company, whether it's a, a, a you know, um, a, a bank or another financial services um, firm. But the, the challenge we have is a lot around our currencies, our inflation, you know, the, the fact that we, we collect monies um, um, locally, but then the interest rate may be tied to a, yeah, you know, other, other currencies can be a challenge. So debt can serve a purpose, I think, in a business that has a very high um, return or a very high growth trajectory. Because when you're talking about interest, interest rates in double dig digits, in the 20s, in the 30s, that's, that's a very high interest rate. And the question we always have to ask ourselves is, how quickly can I grow 100 units of money to become 130 or 140 units of money in the time that I have to pay back those 100 units and still make, make, make a return? Um, so in terms of going for debt, yes, people can go for debt. You have to be very, very clear that this is not as patient as equity. It requires that your business has a very clear strategy on how it generates return. If you're in a low margin business, then in some cases that return is almost way impossible, right? We have some industries where the mid margins can be 5%, 10%. How are you going to actually fund debt that that's high? So consider these three different aspects depending on your, 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 um, you know, where you are in your growth, but more importantly, what you see as your long-term strategic um, approach to your business and whether you want a business that's just about you and what you can see or a business that really, because we're having bold conversations about driving African prosperity here. And I, I entreat SMEs to rather fall into the latter category that says, this business is not actually about me, 
It's about the impact I can make in my country, in my continent, and my community. Um, Missy, what you're saying is deep, um, very deep, and we're really excited to have you speak to us about these things. Um, well, I, one, and I know Kojo is compiling the questions from the audience, and we will be putting this to you. Um, but for my end, you touched something that really is deep, and you talked about even as a business owner, you need to put yourself in the mind of the financial, right? You talked about thinking, you know, what is in it for the financial and how do you position yourself or your business to actually meet those needs? And so I thought that whilst you, you know, you've talked about the grants, you've talked about the equity and you've talked about debt, I wanted you to sort of take us into the mind of the financial. What do they look for in order to give you the funding, right? So there's the grants, there's the, there's the equity, there's the debt. So why don't you take us there? You know, you have a good idea, you have a business you're running well, you've kept your records, you know, you've done a very good financial business model and, you know, you've designed it well. The reason why I'm asking this, Lucy, is because one of the persons who is asking the question is saying, you put out, you know, you have all this good business model and you give it to the investor, the investor gives you money, and someone put it in the question and said, many of the businesses then, you know, the owners then start to buy big cars, you know, get big houses, you know, and, and they go big, you know, and instead of using the money strictly for the business that, you know, the money that you got for the business, we rather redirect that money into perhaps buying big cars and big houses. So yeah, two things. One, take us into the mind of the financial. How do you win their hearts to give you the grants? to give you the money, to give you the loan that is going to change your business. But also the most important thing is that how do you stick to your business plan and your business model when you get this funding? Lucy. I'm, I'm smiling so broadly because I absolutely love this question. And we're going to get very candid with each other in this conversation. Um, so let me take a step out, out of Africa and speak specifically to the context of many, not all, but many international investors. Um, about six years ago, I'm at this conference um, in Switzerland. We're talking about opportunities of attract attracting funding to Africa. Similar to this, there was a whole conference day, um, SMEs. Um, and one potential investor, which I'll be very honest, I'm very passionate about the African continent. So when people, um, make throw away negative comments about the continent. I, I, I do take them quite personally because I think it's unacceptable. However, sometimes we put, some of us give people, some people this ammunition, which is exactly why the, this participant is asking this question. So this potential financier goes on the stage and says something like, oh yes, you know, but they're here all asking for money for investors, but um, what they all do is that they're sitting in Africa and they're all driving big cars. And I was obviously annoyed on two levels. One is around the fact that it's, a, it's an overgeneralization of an entire continent of, of several different people. Yes, does it happen sometimes? Yes, that's why we're, we're, the question has been asked again today. But to present that to a room full of people who are potential investors right there has almost killed the conference, the purpose for why we're there. Um, and so I, 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 had to, I had to take a, a step back and, and I, you know, I, I, I corrected that. So your question ties back to the statement I made about business owners being able to see themselves at, not as their businesses or not tied or wedded to their businesses, but being able to see their businesses as an entity that says a community, a country, a region, a country, yeah, the entity is more than me. This entity must go forward. Buying a big car that does not serve any business purpose, that is just solely for your own gratification or for your own ability to show off and show people that you're in business, I will inequivocably equivocably say is wrong. Your investor money is not for your personal enrichment. Your investor money is not for your personal use. 
your investor money is not for you to go and show people in your village that you're successful. Categoric statement. We've already touched on processes and governance. I won't go through that again, but what I would say is that this is why processes and governance are important. Because if you have the right people around you, they should challenge why the money you have borrowed with a good business plan is suddenly funding a car that's not part of the business plan. Now you could argue to me and say, Lucy, this business um, needs a truck for delivery and trucks are not too cheap. The truck should be in the business plan. It should be in the plan and it's the utility of it should be in the plan. What it's going to do, why it's, it's the right way to transport your whatever logistical needs you have and you, you can't use an outside vendor for it, should be in the plan. So there's never an excuse, right, for taking that investor money to yourself. Now, they're very different cases. When a business is at a stage of maturity where um, vehicle provision is part of the, the, the reward scheme for employees, which is still not about the owner. But even that, an investor, whether they're providing debt or equity, has the right to challenge and query why that is the case, why that is necessary. Is it market rate? Is it the way you, you uh, attract the best talent? So let me repeat again. Your investor money is not for you to show off. We need to shift our mindsets away from this assumption that just because I'm called a businesswoman or you're called a businessman, I have to show off to the whole world that it means success. Success is not about driving a nice car to show. Success is about your business actually growing and doing well. So pivoting back to the heart of your question there, Solomon. Um, one of the things we insufficiently talk about uh, for our, with our SMEs is being able to demonstrate the ability to execute the plan. So you attract the money because you have, A, because you had a nice business plan that says over the next five years, this is what can happen. But a good investor will equally ask about your track record of execution. So they're not only interested in your forward looking plan, but they're interested in some of the history of your business. And when they look about at the history of your business, they're not just looking at your, your P&L, your profit and loss sheet and your balance sheet and you know, your cash flows and how things have evolved, but your ability to articulate the execution and what you have learned out of the execution. Because there's no point telling me a lofty idea of what will happen in five years if you can't clearly tell me what happened in the last two years, what you did, how you learned and how you grew through it. So a bit, uh, to, to talk about execution, talk about your challenges, what you've learned, how you overcame them, to provide the confidence of that forward-looking view of where you're going um, with this business. So there's a business plan. There's a, a, a vision of a, I don't like to say destination, but a, a, a point in time of where you want to get to, your five-year vision, your 10-year vision, and 15-year vision, which may not all be the same, but maybe you start at five, and clearly being able to demonstrate the ability to execute. You know, we have too many SMEs who focus on how difficult it is to do business. And the more you tell your investor about the difficulty without clearly articulating how you deal with the difficulties and the challenges, you undermine their confidence in your ability to, 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 to deliver. So let me bring my answer together. We've talked about the, those assets that have nothing to do with the business. They're a no-no, let's take them off the table. Now let's talk about not just the ideas, but let's focus on the ability to execute and deliver. The ability to consistently do the things that we do every single day to make the business grow and, and, and prosper. That the uh, uh, investor absolutely needs to see a track record of, and they absolutely need to have the confidence that you'll be able to continue to do so. Great. Um, we've done an hour already. We have about 30 more minutes to go. Wow. Yes. <laughs> and you have a lot of questions. I have a lot of questions, but... Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll keep my answers shorter then. Less stories, yes. more, more, more um, direct answers. Okay, so I'll, I'll pick some questions from the audience. And when I come back to my own, I'd like to know where businesses and must position themselves when it comes to environmental sustainability. I sat at the table two weeks ago discussing funding and 
the investors asked what our environmental and social management plan was. We had it, but I've been talking to a lot of businesses and ask, asking them these questions, and some, some of them will just tell you, this is not an African problem. <laughs> this, is, this, this is a first world problem. They've arrived and they're thinking about things beyond our needs. So, um, I'll, I'll seek you, your can, can I break the ice there? Um, so the first yeah. time in the Ugandan budget, they allocated money for climate change. Imagine, <laughs> first time in Uganda's budget, while they were reading the national budget, they allocated about 290 billion shillings to be spent on climate change. And I was just there thinking, um, are we here <laughs> to discuss climate change or are we still in the development phase? So yeah, I hear you. Kojo yes. Solomon, I can tell you in a one short sentence is that both of you are describing people thinking about what's on the investor's mind. That's, that's the, that is the crux of why it's in a budget and why it's being asked at a table, because that is what the investor is thinking about. You always have to think about their perspective. Great. Now, the first question is from Gilbert Ama, and he wants to know in what ways can we resolve the issue of SMEs in Ghana? And for that matter, Africa view, viewing loans and fund support as if they are returns on investment. So some businesses, when they go for loans, they treat the loans as returns on, on investment. That's where they'll go and buy the latest LC300 and go and buy a house instead of investing the money in the business and all that. So how do we treat that, resolve that issue? That's from um gilbert Ama. um so 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 the number one w w resolution mechanism is um due diligence and and oversight so the upfront due diligence should be done in, in, in and that i'm talking about from the lender's perspective or the investor's perspective due diligence means that you're very clear on exactly what your money is going to be spent on um and oversight means that you're going back to check what your money is being spent on um it's a big issue, but then we have to remember that most of the business who, who do that in the long run don't do well. Um, so maybe on this call, we have some people who are actually on the other side in the lending position, whether they're equity investors or they're, they're, you know, they're financiers from a financial services firm point of view, so on and so forth. The due diligence and oversight are absolutely important. And it has to go to the extent that if the, the money has been misused, two things can happen. One is that there can be demands for it to be returned, i.e. said vehicle should be sold and the money actually returned to the firm because it's not a, a, an invest, investment is not actually a return. Um, but in extreme cases, actually, that person has to leave the business. Um, and this is where I think part of the fear of, of, of equity dilution comes up with um, some um, businesses because they're afraid to have that sort of what I call Lord and master of all I survey and, and approach to their business. Being held accountable means equally that at some point, if it's deemed that you're no longer fit to run the business, even if you're the founder, then it can happen that you have to leave. So we really need to be clear on governance rules and structures around um, um, businesses and have the courage to make those calls because Again, what those people are doing are creating the opportunity for that investor that I mentioned to go on the stage and say, these Africans will just use your money to buy cars. Yeah, great. Now, Deborah Ankansa wants to know, for a young and industrious graduate who wants to start up a business, a business yet finds it uh, difficult in connecting with the right raw material sources, what we should a business like mine turn to and attract investors to help fund and connect to the right sources of raw material? This is a very difficult question because I'm not really clear on the sorts of the sort of tech, the context she's speaking of, whether it's raw material that has to be imported into the country, whether it's raw material that's re readily available in her home country. Um, so a little bit, uh, a little bit difficult. Um, what I would say is that obviously when it comes to importation, then the working capital needed is higher because even apart from the goods themselves, you, have, you need the, the capital around the logistics as well. I would encourage every young person to think about starting small. 
And I'll give, I'll use a practical example. There's a young lady in Ghana. I met her six years ago. When, when I met her six years ago, I think by then she had left university, but she hadn't started her business. She was um, starting her business. Um, some people may have heard of her. Her business is called Big Sam. She's been talked about quite recently. But when I met her, she was in that space of, I just need inspiration. She starts this market trading business where she buys food produce, delivers it to people, and then they pay afterwards. Um, and in this time period, especially through COVID, her business continued to grow because many of us no longer wanted to go to the market at all. And she's grown her business now to a point where she even has food bundles. So instead of saying, I need pepper, tomato, fish, and so on, she says, you know, here's a bundle to feed, you know, X number of people, banquet and okro soup. I'll, I'll, I'll get you all the ingredients. You don't need to write a list. And the reason why I use her as an example is that the inputs and what she's providing to customers are not hers. She's not a yeah. farmer. She doesn't have a market stall. She didn't even have a store when she started this business, right? But she started with very limited capital to where she is now. Um, the, you know, the person asking the question can research it. But my point here is that as a young people, a person starting a business, start with what's in front of you. Start with what you can afford. Start with, you know, the, the, the 500 cities that somebody is willing to give you or the 500 cities you're able to raise because you went and took a part-time job and you saved your money. Our mindset has, has to shift from it can't happen till I have everything to a mindset that says, I will start with what I have in my hands, right? It's exactly what Mo it happened when Moses was sent to go and, um, you know, um, take the Israelites to the promised land. Yeah. He says, look, I'm not the guy. I'm not your guy. I don't have anything. I can't. And the question God asks, what's in your hand? And I like to ask people, what is in your hand? What do you have hold of today? Start with that. Great. And um, if I can also help Deborah here, because I'm now into commodities and agribusiness. Um, when it comes to raw material sourcing, you need to build your own credibility so you can attract credit opportunities. So for example, if you need one ton of raw materials and you can only afford to pay, say, half of that, buy the half and arrange a 30-day, 60-day credit facility for the remaining. If you're able to pay consistently, you get to a point where you could even take four tons all on a 60-day credit or 120-day credit. But what some people don't do is that they don't build their value chain very well, so they'll take the raw material, they'll not get the recoveries for it or the returns they will not be able to pay and then they burn that bridge so if you if you are ready to build your credibility be disciplined you you attract credit facility if it's for imports if you stick to what lucy said and you manage your books very well your value chain your profitability everything you can get lcs to cover your imports uh, which will help you run so i think these are some of the things that somebody like you can do there's a comment before the next question Dr. Bennett Quente says that um, sometimes the requirements for funding and investment readiness are burdensome on SMEs. For example, business plan, feasibility study, environmental impact assessment, info memo, et cetera, which are expensive. So SMEs need support for these to become ready for financing. And this is a challenge I'll throw to AB and David to lead in the policy discussion at the national level and on the continental level. So that government will put this type of support, will make this type of support available for SMEs. So institutions like the GIPC and all these can help SMEs with free services when it comes to some of these things or subsidized services to prepare them for investment, Lucy. Yeah, and Kojo, I really like that, 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 that comment because in this discussion, of course, we are intentionally focusing on what the SME themselves can do um, because this is about empowering them boldly. Um, but I do um, appreciate Dr. Bennett's um, comment and input there because these are very important issues that are not directly in the hands of the SMEs. Um, and they're in, in, in the hands of policymakers, um, leaders, executors, the SMEs are leaders, but you know, I'm, I'm talking about sort of more political leadership. Um, so in addition to that comment about what needs to happen, let me throw in a very provocative um, statement. Our electorate goes too easy on political leadership. And what I mean by that is that our electorate demands too little. We're having, we're allowing ourselves to be tied up in conversations that are petty, that are small, when we should be challenging ourselves to demand this sort of structural change 
that will actually make the whole environment marketplace better for everyone. And yet we go to elections and we focus on very minor, minor things. We treat political parties like their football teams, my team versus your teams. And instead of really querying, what do I need? Even as an SME, when you are casting your vote, are you making sure that your representative knows what matters to you and that you hold them to account to seeing the change that you need that there is in their control? So I use the word indirectly. Indirectly, we're not directly in charge of that, but we're directly able to influence policymakers by our choices. I'll leave it as that. This is not a political discussion, but I feel that we need to take our needs and demands even to that sphere in our thinking and make clear what we will accept and what we won't accept to accelerate the change that we need because we can't keep having these conversations about difficulties in doing business, policies that need to change, and year after year, generation after generation, find ourselves in the same position. Thank you, Lucy. I'll go to the next question from Paul Ajay. And he says, this question of market size is indeed an issue. Even at the university level, I asked how one could calculate or determine one's market size. This question hardly elicited a response. So Lucy, how is that measured or calculated? Kindly let me know. Okay, so when you say market size, you're really talking about the opportunity, the addressable market, your potential customers. There's several statistical me methods for doing this. Um, and I would encourage an SME who doesn't have a lot, a lot of funding to actually sample, right? So yes, if you take a country that has a population of 20 million people, you're not going to go around and ask even a, a, a tiny fraction of a fraction of the 20 million whether there, there is, a, you know, whether your product has a viable market opportunity. What you should do is take the time to take a sample, a relative sample. Um, there are statistical models that tell you whether asking 100 people is enough or 20, 200 people, whatever. Take the time to do that. And then based on that, extrapolate. At some point in future, when you work for a large organization, what we tend to do in large organizations is do an independent commissioning to do that analysis. But while you're a small SME, don't let your answer be zero. Let your answer be, I have queried this market. I have taken a sample size of 200. I've looked at the demographic, and you know, in those 200, I had 50 people who are in this age range or this background, 50 people who are here, 50 people here, 50 people were here. Based on my sample size of 200, this is what I estimate, in given the full population, eliminating people who are out, you know, too young to buy, too old to buy, so on and so forth, uh, based on what I'm selling, this is what I see as the market opportunity. Will that answer be 100% correct? No. But it could potentially be as much as 80% correct. The question is, have you even queried the market at all? Query the market. Because for an investor, again, they need to see in your model some analysis that clearly demonstrates an understanding of the opportunity. The base is a uh, 1,000 people. It's all the potential people. Or whether there's an opportunity for 100,000 customers. You have to have some insight and grow your insights year on year. Great. Thank you very much, Lucy. I'll go to the next question. And Solomon, if you have any other questions or comments, you can come in after this. Um, Max Ikongbe, I, I'm sorry if I didn't mention your name right, my brother from Nigeria. Uh, he says, great discussions. Nigeria is currently driving towards the passing of a startup act. I'd like to hear Lucy's thoughts on the utility of a startup act to funding and any pitfalls to watch out for. Another difficult question because I have no idea what the Startup Act contains. I am assuming, so let me answer based on assumptions because we make assumptions um, in business. I'm assuming that the question is that the Act will, will do things like maybe um, provide different interest rates for SMEs or when it comes to business registration, make it easier or eliminate certain costs or maybe the Food and Drugs Board will make it easier for SMEs to have their, their testing done. I don't know. I, I, I'm assuming it's an enabling, enabling act. Um, in, in, in our environment, I believe that anything that is targeted to make um, the work, the doing business for the SMEs smoother and easier is a good thing. Too often in several countries, we are judging SMEs by the same yardstick that we would use to judge um, a multinational organization, as an example. I haven't seen sufficient variation 
um, in the full in, in the approach. And this is important because a large multinational organization by default has um, much more resources to deal with some of these challenges than an SME does. So I'm assuming that the act is to ease um, doing business for SMEs. And in that case, I believe that it would be um, a good thing for SMEs if managed well. And, and also it will be a good thing for the country if businesses who are not SMEs are not allowed to forcibly take advantage of it because you have to be clear that every country needs, um, you know, needs inputs, financial inputs to run. We can't erode what is, is directed as SMEs. And through COVID, we've seen this in several countries where funding and opportunities and support that was supposed to um, support SMEs ended up being um, absorbed by some established companies even in very developed markets. Gilbert says the ownership threat by SMEs in equity financing is a problem for me. 100% of 1 million is 1 million, but 20% of 10 million is 2 million. So it's basically pushing for us to rearrange ourselves and embrace equity the right way. Ken, Muyanga, Ken Muyanga says that very few business founders are willing to relinquish their share for equity financing. Is it because of lack of trust of who is joining in and varying understanding of the company vision? I think Lucy addressed this earlier, but if you want to add something to it, you, you can go ahead, Lucy. No, no, I'm good. I would just re-emphasize the mindset shift. And I think Gilbert's comments also applies to this. But we have to stop obsessing. You know, your job, your company is not, is not your identity. It's part of who you are, but it's not who you are. Let the business have the opportunity to thrive and grow. Mustafa Yusuf. Adebola says, like Kojo mentioned, ESG, what or how do African entrepreneurs respond to this? I remember some years ago, it was corporate governance or something else. Dr. Bennett also mentioned something similar where there are so many complex barriers we need to um, overcome. But a look at countries like China shows how they empowered small businesses uh, before they became big. What custom approach can we use in Africa to get around this for SMEs? Um, that's a, a loaded question, and we should we could spend um, you know a whole probably a week on that, and we'd still be talking. So let's be clear for everyone's benefit. Um, ESG is environmental, social, and governance. That's what the acronym stands for. For anyone who may not be aware of it, and it's really about thinking about your environmental impact, your social uh, uh, impact, and sort of the, the governance that you run as a, um, a, a as a company. Very simplistically put. Um, I, I believe that there is no market and no place on the planet that doesn't have some degree of ESG responsibility. The challenge with it that we have on the continent is that a lot of the time, especially if the investor is international from outside of Africa, then they are making um, assumptions that we have to meet the same ESG requirements. Which is why I really believe, and I look forward to the day, and I believe that AF, AF, AFCFTA is part of you know, this opening up. We need more investors who are African. Let me very, be very clear on this. We need Africans to invest in African businesses so that when they're making demands and oversight of this, these businesses, they understand the context around the, the, the business and make demands that are market relevant. That being said, some of our opportunities, and I, I do believe businesses should um, look at ESG from the lens, through the lens of opportunity and not purely um, overhead. Um, so let me give you a, some very simple example. If we think about ESG, we don't even have to start jumping straight to the, the, you know, the bigger question of climate change. Maybe you think I'm a small, I'm a small business, you know, what is my environmental impact? Your environmental impact can be as simple as how you treat the waste of your business. Are you judiciously disposing of the waste of your business or are you just dumping it on the side down the road because it's not your problem, right? When you talk about social, in your workforce, are you providing opportunities for a wide range of people in your community from different backgrounds to actually have the opportunity to get a job and grow? Or are you speaking, to, talking to only the people who are from your tribe? Are you making sure that you're balanced? You have you know, men and women in your business. Are you saying that as for my business, I'm only going to employ men or only women in my business? These, are, these sound small, but the, what I just touched on is environmental and social. 
governance goes without saying we've talked about it. I'm not going to labor and belabor it anymore. But you have to appreciate that ESG is on a sliding scale depending on where you are and what you're doing. And we can all play a small role, however small we think we are, because we're talking SMEs. But most importantly, I would encourage you, the of businesses, to view ESG as really a contributor to the sustainability, the long-term sustainability of their business. Take a put a positive lens on it, and you'll be surprised at the benefits you you you'll get out of thinking about ESG in the context of your business. Thank you very much, Lucia. <laughs> to to add to um, your advocacy for ESG, one of the reasons why African businesses don't really make a lot of profit is that we let a lot a lot of things go waste. So, for example, in the right value chain, rice brand for a very long time was going waste. The husk were going waste, but elsewhere. If you study Kalumborg, they would use that to generate electricity or to mix with something else to produce food for poultry. So once you set up an ESG plan, it helps you to also optimize the waste in your system that you have yeah. regarded as waste into um, input for other processes, which yeah. in the end helps you to, 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 to generate more revenue and more profit. Yeah. For your so, you know my favorite my favorite example of that is a company called Zarco. Again, I, I, I like engaging these businesses and talking to them. And what he processes is um, coconut husk, right? Across the continent, we consume coconut, and sometimes you sadly see it just the husk piled up somewhere, just being burnt. He actually ch change, it changes it, he tra he processes it into environmentally friendly um, charcoal, which actually burns longer. Um, than um, traditional charcoal. So suddenly that waste has become a business product that he is using to serve, serve the market. Um, you, can, you can Google them. I'm not, I'm not an, a shareholder or anything. I just like to talk about these businesses who are, who are doing well and serving purposes. So ESG can be very positive for our continent. We shouldn't treat it as a, as a, a first world problem. We should look at, look at it through the lens of our context in Africa. All right, Lucy, that's quite yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kojo. Lucy, that's quite fascinating um, to hear that someone is taking advantage of that and then creating a new product. A number of questions are coming up, and I think Kojo will continue to bring them up. Uh, one of the concerns that came up with, um, earlier was that someone was talking about, he said, I think that debt financing should be out of way for African SMEs. But Lucy, right now, many of the Central banks are increasing on the CBR, right? Money inflation. Um, so money is becoming increasingly expensive. And so you have um, SMEs that really want to get, for example, debt or money to inject in their businesses to grow. But money is getting increasingly expensive, like I said, at a higher interest rate. So how, what do you advise an SME that really wants this money and it's available but it's at a higher interest rate how do they find that you know that that thin line of okay i need money but this money is expensive but can i take the risk of taking this money in especially from commercial banks right and so i wanted you to come in there what advice do you give smes that need financing the money is available but at a higher interest rate but they need money anyway yeah, this is a very um, challenging question because um, globally, high interest rates, especially because economic and financial models have been built around certain assumptions, particularly um, around how you use interest rates to fight inflation. And in a post-pandemic world, everywhere in the world, we're seeing higher infl uh, inflation rates than, than um, normal. Even in markets where traditionally um, inflation has been low, uh, we're seeing an acceleration. In some places, they're, they're looking at 40-year highs in very mature markets. So the fact that interest rates um, um, are, are going up um, is, is global. But also, unfortunately, we, we do have stand a high chance that that increase will continue. So as an SME, taking a risk on, an, uh, on, on debt financing, you have to, there are a number of things to think about, but I'll, I'll, 
I'll just position two of them. If you make an assumption that interest rates are going to continue to go up, then in some ways it makes sense to actually borrow sooner than later because if you borrow today and then in three months the rates are higher, um, you'll say, well, I should have borrowed three months ago instead of it three months later when it's gone up even more. So there's that sort of a little bit of arbitrage or opportunity, which is not, it's not great. I'm not saying this is, that it's great that interest rates are going to go up, but you have to have an interest in how market trends are going. So one is understanding the market trends. But secondly, in terms of taking the risk to actually borrow the money, you re you, we can't take risk for the sake of taking risk. We have to take a risk that is based on whether we think we can actually, we, we stand a high chance of making the money back. So not risk just for the sake of risk. So then the question becomes, um, how as your, are you pivoting your business to make sure that you can generate a return to meet that interest rate payment? Don't just take the risk, but if the, if, the, if the central banks are reacting to the environment, how are you as an SME reacting to your environment? Now, some may say that means I need to increase prices. And in some cases, in many cases, we've seen that because we live in an inflationary environment. So, but, but price increase is the easy way out. It's necessary in many cases and go ahead and do it. But as an SME, can you take a step back and actually challenge your actual business model in terms of the cost drivers and is there a way that you can actually reduce your cost base to make your business more profitable to serve that debt to service that debt so i'm saying interest rates will be continue continue to go up we've already dealt with the topic of making decisions i'm not going to go back there but let's assume you're an estimate who finds yourself i must for that that money how are you going to change your model, not only through price increases, but the harder work of revisiting the, the way you serve your customers to increase your bottom line, to make serving this, servicing that debt more viable? You know, being an SME is tough business, and it requires that we are on our toes addressing every single line in our PL as part of our model consistently. So don't just borrow the money, challenge your business before you even borrow the money to be sure that that risk that you're taking to borrow the money is worth taking. Wow, that, that, that's really interesting. Um, Kojo, I'm coming to you, but Gil Batia is saying, in what ways can we resolve the issue of SMEs in Ghana, and for that matter, Africa, are viewing loans and fund support as if they are return on investment? Lucy? Yeah, I think we touched on that earlier. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, we, yeah, we came we to that. that. All right, Coach, uh, over to you. That there are a few comments I'll just run through quickly. Emeka Albert says, thanks a lot for your valuable inputs. Please, can you say something about accelerator programs, how they fit into the mix of startup growth? That's one question. So I want to add one more to it. Accelerator Sorry, can, you repeat that? can you repeat that one, please, Kojo? So Albert wants to know um, for you. To, he wants you to say something about accelerator programs and how they fit okay. into startup growth. And I would like to mm -hmm. add crowdfunding as well. Should startups be looking at crowdfunding um, as a way of raising capital uh, to run? So Albert is talking about accelerators, and I'm adding crowdfunding to it. So now with this question, you're coming home to Lucy. <laughs> um, <laughs> Accelerators are hugely important, right? Because essentially, not only do they challenge, and, and now this is more in, in the sphere of, of, of particularly tech innovation, not only do they challenge the, the inventors and the founders in terms of their actual business um, acceleration and how to grow that business, but more importantly, accelerators can serve to help people learn very quickly other skills that they need to make their business viable. So I think accelerators absolutely have, um, 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 you know, a, a place, a, an important role. 
I, I serve on, on one such um, um, uh, organization. And if you just see the, the work businesses put into to even just get into the accelerator program and you look at their thinking, you see the benefit that acceleration brings to them. So that's one. I believe in accelerator programs. They have to be well run, well supported, well funded, but they can be, you know, they can really help you know, businesses uh, jump ahead. And also a lot of the time, the people who serve on accelerator whether it's the accelerator, whether it's the board, the, the reviewers, and so on, they tend to be people who are experienced and seasoned. They may not have founded an SME themselves, but they've seen several businesses. So, definite um, opportunity. Crowdfunding. This has been on my mind for so many years. So, somebody's on this call who feels that they have a model that is, um, you know, Africa appropriate for how we'll manage a crowdfunding. Um, organization i'd love to hear the ideas because i think this is definitely a gap in our market again it goes back to the need for proper governance because you need to transparency if you're going to do crowdfunding especially where, where it's crowdfund this is not we're not talking just giving fundraising for free we're talking crowdfunding where you you owe these people as your investors um, it's an opportunity we haven't sufficiently tapped into but imagine you don't, maybe you don't want 50 you know let me let me use a do, dollar denomination only because i want everybody listening to be able to translate convert it into their local currency not because it's my preferred um, currency but imagine if you could raise you know um 10 dollars from you know a uh, 100 100,000 people in this uh, crowd fund for each person it's a small contribution from their point of view but suddenly this is a fund that can support many uh, SMEs to do well to grow their businesses we need to think about what we have in our hands what we have is never too small our mindset has to be how do we organize the resources we do actually have in our hands to support african businesses to support african SMEs to grow to become the businesses that serve the continent and the globe remember every single business you see on the planet every single so-called multinational big company whatever it is every single one started the started life as an sme food for thought thank you thank you lucy and richard wants to know if there's a platform that links smes to raw materials um i know that in ghana if you go to gepa gepa um, can help you if you're a startup looking for raw materials. GEPA is a Ghana Export Promotion Authority. They've been mm -hmm. working a lot on SMEs and how to give them support. You can also talk to the uh, GIPC as well. They've also been doing some interesting things in that particular regard. So, Richard, that's for me in Ghana. I don't know. Solomon, do you have a platform like that in Uganda that you can share? Um, well, not that I know of, but I'm sure they are okay. there. All right. Okay, now Lucy, you asked whether there's somebody in crowdfunding who can share their experiences. Well, the business I run now um, has a product, crowdfunding product. And um, over the past one year, since May last year, we've raised close to 4.5 million cities to invest in soya, maize, and rice. We did a thousand acres of soya. We did maize as well. We have a thousand acres of rice, which is being harvested. And we've got 1,200 acres of so. 1,000 acres of soya under irrigation, 1,200 of soya under rain-fed. And all this was through crowdfunding. Um, because they are grains, we, are, we operate in six-month cycles. So after six months, we'd have planted, harvested, sold, and we pay you back with um, some return on investment, which is usually between 12 to 17%, depending on the grain. So I'll share more with you on that. Um, it's I'd love to share more. We have a yes. big, you see, I, I have a big problem with this conversation, Kodro. I should have been interviewing you. This, 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 you know, I, I should have fl flipped the script, the script and said, Kodro Solomon, tell me what's going on in, in, in your market. But yes, I'd love to hear more. That sounds brilliant. Yes, so you can find more in serwa.com.gh, N S E R E W A dot com dot g h um that's the business i do now. Me. i'm writing but you've gone past nse r e w a dot com dot g h okay so i i will also pose that to the person who asked the question for crowdfunding in africa um n s e r e w a dot com dot g h even if you don't find yourself in ghana and even if you don't want to um uh, invest in Syria, i would encourage us we need to share ideas. We need to accelerate our growth and development. If somebody is doing it and it's working and you're in a different market and you think it's not there, I worked for a company that once said copy with pride. 
not that could you could you would we'll, we'll be you know, but you're not offended but you know we need to learn from each other and move quickly move 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 thank you lucy so we are wrapping up the conversation um solomon i don't know if you have any final words or a final question to ask um, well um well Kojo, for me i think that lucy i'm going to tell you this um I have done so many events, I've moderated so many conversations. This is one that I had to pay extra attention to because everything that you've been talking about also concerns me because um, you know, I have a business, but I also run an organization. So trying to take in as much as I can from you and I've been really writing literally everything in my notebook, <laughs> trying to, uh, perhaps I'll go back to it. And one of the persons asked me the question that, is there a link to this? Was this recorded so that I can go back to and, and watch it? Um, but Lucy, thank you very much. Um, I've really, really learned a lot from you. Um, I have learned so much, so much. And, but my biggest take home from here, um, of all the things I've learned, I've learned that I have to be in the mind of the financier or the investor. Um, what is he thinking? You know, what is his interest? You know, how do you get it? And for my end, for the organization that I work for, I'm a CEO there, but that also means that I'm the salesperson of the organization because a CEO is a sales money, the big title. And, and therefore, you have to look for money. So a lot of the things that you've been talking about, so you're thinking, if I'm writing this grant, what is in the mind of the person who is giving out the grant? If I'm asking for this loan, what is it that that person is looking for? And perhaps... That also goes to say you said something that the money is very competitive. You know, someone in Ghana wants it. Someone in, in, in Buenos Aires wants it. Someone in New York wants it. So how do you, you know, be a notch higher? Someone in Lagos wants it. So getting in the mind of the investor and the financial, trying to understand what their interests are is very important when you want access to money and funds. So you see for me, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, Kojo, over to you. Yes, and thank you from my end too. I've learned a lot. Process documentation is something I've really not thought about to institutionalize in my business, even though we have some. And that sticks out for me. And that smaller businesses should be thinking of working together to grow bigger businesses. That's also one of the key things for me. And Lucy, on behalf of the AB and David team, I'd like to say a big thank you to you. You've been an inspirational leader. Um, when I was a full-time journalist, there wasn't a moment I, I, I didn't learn a new thing whenever I came, even to promote your products and your services. There was always something you left with us. And as a businessman now, we look up to you to inspire us to do a lot more. So thank you on behalf of the team and on behalf of our viewers. If you have the final words for us, Solomon. So in Ghana, we call something Kofiuku, right? So that's the last injection we give you before you die. Now we are going to fail <laughs> our inability to raise funding and resurrect into businesses and a continent that is able to attract the right funding. So Lucy, give us the Kofiuko, that last injection to kill the past and put us in a new future of possibilities. Absolutely. So before I give you Kofiyo, um, I want to say thank you to you both. Thank you, Kojo. Thank you, Solomon. Um, it's been a great time. Um, thank you to the organizing team, AB and David, and the wonderful viewers, including those who will view this when it's um, replayed, available as a replay. Um, look, the fundamental message I want everybody to walk away with is this. Africa is a prosperous continent. I didn't say will be. I said is. The question is, how many of us will quickly shift our mindset to see the prosperity that lies in front of us, within reach of us, versus consistently focusing on what is missing? Africa is prosperous. Engage your mind and be a participant in Africa's prosperity. Wow. Thank you very much, Lucy, and thank you, Solomon. Great guy. When I come to Uganda, show me around. Let's interact with businesses and SMEs, and let's grow together. Kojo, uh, East Africa is open for business, so West come Africa over. is open for business as well.
come over, come over, let's, let's do business. I'll hand over to the team from AB and David for the closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, that was a very insightful session. I believe I believe businesses were able to pick up a few gold nuggets to help them as they journey in the bold new normal. Transcripts and highlights of this session will be sent to participants, and the whole video will be available online so the conversation can keep going. A special thank you to Her Majesty to borrow for those accolades. Her Majesty Lucy Christ for taking time off your very, very busy schedule to spend time with us today. Kojo and Solomon, thank you very much for moderating this very exciting session. And to all who joined us in the virtual auditorium on Facebook, on YouTube, we really appreciate your time and participation. Be sure to visit the exhibition hall and the networking rooms before you log off check out our vendors and talk to a few people before you sign off. The Africa Business Conversation will come your way with another exciting session in September. Details will be communicated, so make sure you keep an eye out on our social media handles at AB and David on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube, on LinkedIn. Or you can visit our website, www.abdavid.com. And so we come again with a very exciting session. God bless and bye bye. So much music. Okay.